A very good morning to our esteemed speakers, distinguished guests and fellow participants. I am Chi Wing and I will be your MC for today. On behalf of the joint organizers, L2, ICON and Legal Plus, we would like to thank everyone for taking time off your busy schedule to join our webinar series titled Contract Clauses Contractor Must Know. Today, our panelists will talk about the PAM contract. Ladies and gentlemen, our webinar today is actually a parallel event to the standard form of building contract forums 2022, which is happening to tomorrow. We would like to take this opportunity to give away five virtual passes for the forum. In order for you to stand a chance to win, uh, to win these passes, all you have to do is to follow the following three steps. First, you need to attend this webinar. And secondly, you need to tell us who is the author of the book, Standard Form of Building Contracts Compared, via WhatsApp to 011-5113-5002 at the end of this webinar, together with your full name and email address. And lastly, you need to follow L2 Icon's LinkedIn page for the giveaway announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite our moderator, Satinder Singh Sandhu, to take over the floor. Satinder is the managing partner of Sandhu and Co Advocates and a very experienced litigator. He has a specialist master in construction law from the University of Auckland, New, New Zealand, and is principally involved in construction and commercial litigation, covering various aspects of construction law, company law, commercial, contracts, insolvency, negligence, property litigation, and alternative dispute resolution. Over to you, Satinder. Thank you, Jiweng. I also wish to thank uh, L2 Icon, Legal Plus uh, for organizing these informative talks relating to standard form building contracts. So far, we've already covered um, the JKR, AIAC, and FIDIC standard forms. Today, we'll be focusing on the PAM standard form of contract. Just a little bit about PAM. Um, historically, the PAM form can be traced back to the 1960s with the initial form based on the REBA 63 form of contract used in the United Kingdom. The initial form was revised progressively over the years, first to the PAM 98 form, then to the PAM 2006 form, and now to the current PAM contract 2018. The current 2018 form uh, has considered and adopted several changes and practices, including document transmission, single retention sum, extension of time reasoning, SIPA implications, expert determination, certifier role in performance bond, amongst others. Currently, the PAM form has been widely adopted as the standard form of building, uh, standard form used for building works in the Malaysian private sector. The objective of today's webinar is not to go through all the uh, clauses in the standard form today, which is impossible to do in such a short session. But our objective is to focus on certain areas. We will be discussing topical areas such as extension of time and liquidated damages, termination clauses, and uh, the ADR mechanisms available in the PAM contract. With me today, I have uh, three very capable panelists, each of them with years of experience in the field of construction law. Now, let me introduce each one of them one by one. Uh, I wouldn't be going to extensively read out their series, which are all lengthy and long and very distinguished, uh, but I will uh, leave it to you all to have a look at the respective LinkedIn profiles of all of the panelists to get further information on them. Our first speaker is Mr. Taya Nathan Baskaran. Taya is a partner with Baskaran, Kuala Lumpur, and is an associate member of the Crown Office Chambers London. Other than regularly doing front-end and back-end work in the construction law area, he also sits as an adjudicator, an arbitrator, and a mediator. And for those of you who didn't know, he's also an author. He's written a book, Arbitration in Malaysia, a Commentary on the Malaysian Arbitration Act. I actually have a copy of it in my library. <laughs> Good reading, Taya. <laughs> Good morning, Taya. How are you? Very well, Sadinda. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you. Our second speaker today is Mr. Chun Hon Leng. Hon Leng is a partner at Raja Darrell Law and specializes in infrastructure projects with clients that are mostly government-owned infrastructure companies. He has experience in dealing with the whole spectrum of advisory work from pre-contact negotiation all the way to formal dispute resolution. Hong Leng is also an experienced adjudicator and arbitrator. Hong Leng is also the current president of the Malaysian branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. 
Good morning, Hong Ming. Good morning, Satinda. Thank you. And our third speaker today is Ms. Vatsala, who is a senior partner at Zion & Co. She heads up the construction engineering and arbitration practice in the firm, and she specializes in construction and infrastructure disputes. Other than being a seasoned litigator, she's also heavily involved in arbitration. Watsala also strongly believes in giving back to the profession. She has spent the last two decades educating and training young lawyers as a senior lecturer on the University of London International Laws Program and a senior lecturer on the Malaysian Legal Profession at, uh, Qualification Program. Good morning, Watsala. Good morning, Satinda. Looking forward to today's session. Yeah, thank you. Now, we have a bit of a short time frame, so I'll just go straight into it. Now, without further ado, uh, we'll be discussing uh, today's three topics. Taya will be taking on EOT and LAD. Hon Leng will be taking on termination clauses, and Watsala will be focusing on the ADR mechanisms. Taya, my first question is for you. Uh, increasingly, there's been numerous claims recently for extension of time by contractors, and similarly, imposition of liquidated damages by employers. Now, can you give a bit of an explanation to our viewers here today uh, whether the employer will face any difficulty recovering liquidated damages and what are the steps the contractor should comply with in applying for extension of time? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Satinda, for that very uh, insightful uh, question. Uh, I, I've prepared some slides, so let me try to share them. Okay, uh, they should be on the screen now. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th this morning, uh, I will be speaking on liquidated damages and extension of time, uh, particularly in the context of the uh, PAM 2018 contract. Uh, we will be using the PAM 2018 uh, with quantities as an example, but the terms in, in this respect are pretty much the same. Uh, if I can go to the next slide. Yes, so uh, firstly on liquidated damages, Satinda, you mentioned uh, liquidated damages and at the moment there are lots of claims for uh, liquidated damages because of you know lots of delays that have occurred due to somewhat unusual times we are, we are now in. So uh, there is a liquidated damages provision uh, in the PAM uh, 2018 contract. Uh, it, it's a pretty much standard liquidated damages clause, so I won't go through uh, all the provisions. Uh, interestingly, uh, the provision states in clause 22.2 that the liquidated damages are a genuine pre-estimate and that the employer would be entitled to recover the liquidated damages without proof of its loss. Uh, the idea, as, as most of you would know, of having this provision was to overcome the, the, the previous position in law in Malaysia that uh, even with a liquidated damages clause, an employer still had to prove his loss in order to be entitled to recover such loss. Uh, but that position, as probably most of you all are also aware, recently changed with uh, the judgment of the federal court in Quebec uh, in 2019. So now, essentially, what has happened is this. Uh, basically, the onus of proof has shifted. Yeah. So uh, all that is required for the employer now is to prove that there has been a breach of contract, number one. And number two, that uh, there is a liquidated damages clause in the contract. And with that, the uh, employer would be entitled to recover liquidated damages. Uh, he no longer is obliged to prove that the loss uh, he has suffered, the actual loss uh, the employer has suffered. The onus then shifts to the contractor who has to prove that the liquidated damages specified in the contract uh, is unreasonable. So th that that is un that we, most of us in the industry think that that's going to be quite difficult for the contractor to to you know to be actually able to prove that the damages specified in the contract is unreasonable. How do you go about doing that? Uh, some guidance has been offered by the federal court in Quebec. Uh, so basically, uh, so long as some, you know, reflects legitimate interest or is proportional, then it is unlikely to be unreasonable. 
Uh, however, if the sum is extravagant or is beyond anything which the employer could have possibly suffered, then uh, it is likely to be unreasonable. So essentially what has shifted now is the onus has moved. The employer is no longer obliged to show that the sum uh, is, reflects the actual loss he has incurred. Instead, the contractor has to show that the LAD sum is unreasonable. So at present, the PAM 2018 contract, which was published before the uh, decision in Cubic, has, has yet to take into account the Cubic decision uh, expressly. So perhaps future editions of PAM may expressly state that the sum is reasonable, reflects re legitimate interest, and is proportional to overcome any challenges uh, based on Cubic. Uh, there have been judgments subsequent to Cubic uh, that have both uh, applied it as well as questioned it to some extent. So there's been a subsequent judgment of the Court of Appeal in a case called MS Elevators, uh, which interestingly was on the PAM form of contract, albeit, uh, albeit the earlier version of 2006, uh, and in relation to the subcontract, which is slightly different here. Yeah? But uh, in this case, uh, the Court of Appeal basically applied uh, the judgment of the federal court in Cubic. So they recognized the fact that all that now needs to be done is uh, for the employer to show that there is a breach of contract and a provision in the contract that uh, allows for liquidated damages. And with that, the uh, employer would be entitled to recover those liquidated damages. Uh, interestingly, also some guidance is, is, has been given as to what uh, the plaintiff who is challenging it on the basis that it is unreasonable would need to do. Here, the Court of Appeal was moved uh, from the judgment, appears to have been quite moved by the fact that after the subcontract was entered into, at no point did the plaintiffs uh, allege that the uh, sum specified in the LAD clause was uh, illegal, unfair or unreasonable. Uh, the court in the high court had actually reduced the LAD sum, but th this is not so much due to the LAD per se, uh, but more to take into account uh, some of the delay for which the main contractor was responsible for. But uh, a portion of the liquid liquidated damages was recovered by the main contractor from the subcontractor in MS elevators. There's also been uh, another court of appeal judgment. Uh, a judgment in uh, Mac Villa. Th this is quite an interesting judgment as it has sought uh, to distinguish Cubic. Uh, it, it has said that Cubic was a judgment uh, on deposits on not, and not on liquidated damages per se. Uh, and in Mac Villa, the, the Court of Appeal has attempted to, to restate uh, uh, yet again the, the law on liquidated damages. Uh, I'm not sure whether MacVilla is now pending before the federal court. Uh, I would think it should be. Uh, but in MacVilla, it was decided uh, that uh, any sum stipulated in a contract uh, would be a penalty. Uh, and if it is challenged, then uh, the per person seeking to recover the liquidated damages, usually the employer in a building contract, uh, would need to prove the actual sum that they have incurred. So it's reverting back to the pre-cubic position. Uh, however, even if the employer is unable to prove the sum, the, the court remains obliged to award a reasonable sum. Uh, again, uh, some interesting guidance is then offered as to uh, what would be a reasonable sum. And, and in the context of this webinar, it's, it's a particularly interesting that in Mac Villa, it seems to be recognized that if the LAD clause in a, is in a standard form of contract like the PAM contract, uh, then the courts would give due recognition to that and, and would in all likelihood allow that uh, liquidated damages sum. Yeah. Uh, apart from that, uh, on liquidated damages, there has been uh, a recent judgment from uh, the UK Supreme Court in Triple Point, which is quite interesting. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the Supreme Court has, uh, of, of UK has held that in, insofar as liquidated damages under a building contract is concerned, 
uh, damages may be recovered right up to the date of termination, but beyond that general damages would need to be proved. But the, 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 the position here and what's interesting is this, that it's recognized that liquidated damages will run from the completion date up to the termination date. And the Supreme Court seems to have emphasized that that, that that position is something that is accepted and does not need to be even expressly provided for in the contract because everyone is aware of that. Yeah. So this is a very reasoned, interesting judgment from the Supreme Court in triple point. Uh, moving on then to extension of time. Uh, again, the, the PAM contract uh, has a, you know, the, the usual standard uh, extension of time clause. Uh, it has very express provisions in PAM uh, with regards to notice uh, for extension of time. So, so there are two notices that are required under the PAM form of contract. Uh, there is the initial notice under clause 23.1A uh, for notice uh, 28 days after the event of delay, uh, which gives an estimate of the extension of time required. And then there is another notice that has to be uh, issued after that, uh, which has the final claim for extension of time. Uh, and if you look at both these provisions, uh, it is expressly stated that uh, they are conditions precedent uh, to any entitlement to extension of time. Uh, the Court of Appeal has uh, recently provided clarity on, 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 fairly recently provided clarity on these clauses. Uh, all the clarification that has been provided by the uh, Court of Appeal is, is in relation to the uh, PW, the JKR PWD form of contract. Uh, but, but in my view, it, it would be equally applicable to the PAM form of contract. Uh, indeed, the, the terms of the PAN form of contract in this regard are more express than the JKR form of contract. Uh, PAM actually specifies that, uh, you know, notice is required. These are the two notices you have to give. And if you don't give it, you know, uh, it, it is a condition precedent and you would have waived your claim. So that's expressly set out in the PAM 2018 contract, uh, unlike the JKR contract, which has uh, perhaps less express wording. So in, in the case of uh, Prabhadanan, uh, Mantri Basa, Klantan, the Court of Appeal in 2016 recognized in so far, th this is a clause actually on loss and expense for delay, but it's similar, similar drafting on the condition precedent requirement to the extension of time clause. So the, the Court of Appeal enforced that provision, uh, said that it would be strictly construed and all notices uh, must be given before claims can be made this uh, has subsequently, more recently, also been followed uh, in a case called Yuktung uh, Construction. Uh, he, this is quite an interesting case where, uh, in relation to an EOT clause, the Court of Appeal actually set out all the various requirements. So there's the obligation first. This is under the JKR contract, I, I, I say again. Firstly, there's a requirement to issue notice. Secondly, the notice must be uh, for an event of delay specified under the contract. And thirdly, uh, the contractor must have attempted to, to mitigate the delay, which, as you can see, is very similar to the proposition under the uh, PAM form of contract. So in this case, what had happened was uh, the contractor had given notice for some of the delay, and that had been assessed and granted in part. Uh, but apart from that, there were also various events of delay for which uh, no notice had been given. Uh, the contractor then argued that uh, under the JKR form of contract, there was no obligation uh, to give notice. Uh, it was not a condition precedent because, as I mentioned earlier, that's not expressly spelt out in the JKR form of contract. But uh, the, the Court of Appeal was not moved by that. Uh, and they, they, they were influenced by the words used in the JKR form of contract, uh, which is that uh, upon it becoming reasonably apparent, the progress of the works is delayed, the contractor shall forthwith give written notice uh, of that delay. Uh, so the Court of Appeal was moved by that wording. As you can see, the wording doesn't expressly mention a condition precedent per se, like the PAM contract. 
uh, but the Court of Appeal still held that the requirement for notice uh, was a precondition to any entitlement to uh, extension of time. Uh, so, you know, given that that is the position under the JKR uh, form of contract, it will certainly be the position under the PAM form of contract. Uh, the courts uh, appear uh, ready and willing to enforce the uh, condition precedent provisions in extension of time clauses. So insofar as contractors are concerned, it, it is very important to be aware of these provisions. And thank you for that. I, all the notices. I, I, I will need to uh, um, yes. get you to sum up right here because uh, we're right on time right now. So um, if you have nothing Further to add, or just a few words to add before we conclude? No, no, I, I, I'm actually yeah. at, at my last slide. Perfect, uh, perfect. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for thank that, you, Taya. Thank for keeping time. Thank you. Just to add on a bit for, to what Taya just said, another, another uh, point on extension of time that I found quite intriguing in the new PAM 2018 is clause 23.4 as well, where now um, the architects are required to provide reasons for rejecting the contractor's EOT submissions. And... Uh, uh, when the architect issues the certificate of extension of time, he needs to provide details within six weeks from receipt with sufficient particulars from the contractor, for the contractor as well. Now, this is also a good change now because um, it avoids ambiguity and any arguments as to why the architect rejects the contractor's applications. And likewise, if he grants extension of time, he needs to provide necessary details. All right, um, now we'll move on to the next part. Uh, the next question will be for Hong Leng on terminations. Hong Leng, I would like you to concentrate on the very topical area relating to termination of a contract under PAM. Now, can you go through the key provisions uh, relating to determination of a contractor's employment by the employer or the contractor's determination of its own employment and highlight, perhaps if you have time, the types of claims that can be make, made as a consequence thereof? Thank you. Thank you, Satinda. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to do. So um, allow me to share my screen. I have prepared some slides. All right. Yeah, um, I hope all of you can see my screen. Yes, um, so now I'm looking at a determination and termination. So I think the first question that people will ask is that why is there two different things, determination and termination? So we'll come to that later, but you will see that from the PAM contract, um, the term that they use is always determination and it always followed by determination of employment. So um, I think the grounds are pretty clear. It states in um, 25, this is for employer determination. And of course the next clause is for contractor's determination. Failure to commence work, suspension of work, failure to proceed regularly, diligently, persistent refusal to neglect to comply, assignment of subcontracting, abandoned works, and contractors' insolvency. Um, the bulk of this, to be honest, um, there are not much dispute if, let's say, there's a failure to commence work. You know, so the, 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 the guiding comes, so obviously, you know, that, that is called failure to commence work. And if we are talking about the other extreme, <clears throat> like abandon of works, so um, if the contractor uh, demobilized from the site, for example, you know, so then that becomes a very clear case of um, abandon the works. What is less clear is actually <clears throat> the failure to proceed regularly and diligently. And that's where um, I would say the, 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 the bulk of the dispute, you know, that uh, parties will find is actually how do you determine what is meant by failure to proceed regularly and diligently. And like it or not, there will always be um, that, that element of subjectivity um, in terms of how do you measure what is meant by um, regularly and diligently. And of course, we have many cases, uh, many precedents, you know, trying very hard um, to explain what these things are or what these things mean. Uh, but they are always illustrative of a certain circumstances that is very fact sensitive. Okay, so I, I don't particularly find those um, useful other than having the, the, the broad idea that um, failure to proceed regularly and diligently has to deal with a certain degree of some uh, uh, substantiality. So it's not something that, look, you know, because you were slow by three days when you still have another 300 days to go, you know, that, that becomes something that, hey, look, you know, you fail to proceed regularly and diligently. And this, we also have to take into account 
the fact that um, construction activities is always very fluid and, and dynamic in nature. Um, so notwithstanding that we, we know that, you know, in all these projects, you will have your work program to follow, you know, and all these things. Um, it's, it's, it's never possible, okay, to follow it really, you know, to the dot. Um, so things will change on the side and <clears throat> um, many, many, many situations call for certain reaction on the side. So um, all this will have to take into account before we consider whether or not, you know, one can say that a contractor can, 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 uh, can, can be said to have failed to proceed regularly and diligently because it deals with the stages of work, the nature of work, the criticality of the work and the extent of that. So it's, it's a combination of many factors to consider and then you, you, you take a position um, on that. So um, it's not easy, much as all these grounds are trying to make life a little bit uh, 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 easier for someone to, to determine. And we have seen, we have seen that in some contracts where, where, where they try to modify PEM contract, they put certain objective benchmark on what is meant by failure to proceed regularly and diligently. So for example, you, you might have seen some contract which says that if you have fallen behind uh, more than 5% from the targeted progress, that is considered as failure to proceed regularly and diligently. So contracting parties are trying to use this type of mechanism to, to cut down on the subjectivity um, of of, of this ground because that subjectivity is where eventually the disputes will be, okay? And when we know, we know that when it comes to subjectivity, not everybody thinks the same. Now, so let's, let's really look at the procedure. So the procedure in PAM that is adopted is always a two steps procedure, a notice of default and a notice of determination. So um, in order to invoke that, number one, you must have grounds to issue a notice of default and you must of course serve it properly and then Whether scenarios will happen, whether they remedy the default or they don't remedy the default. If they don't remedy the default, then only your, your, your right to issue the notice of determination will come. So all these procedures and all these timelines are all well, well, well mapped out in the PAM contract, so which I'm not going to go through. Okay, So uh, suffice to know that these procedures must be followed. Now, for contractor's determination um, in PAM contract, you will have actually the most important one is the failure to pay certified amount because that is something that again um, is quite obvious and it always happened. Now the second point on, on employer interferes with the issuance of certificates that I would say is extremely difficult to prove. Okay, um, no architect is is going to tell you that yeah 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 employer asked me to put five million that's why I put five million even though I think it should be twenty. No architect is going to admit to that. Uh, I, I assume that you will not have the technology to hack into their, their WhatsApp you know, or, or email you know, to find the trace. So it's difficult because even though on impression, it may well be the case, but you know, architect will always try to justify and say, I honestly believe that it is 5 million. It may be an error of judgment on my part, but this is still my decision and my judgment and my determination and nobody else's. So, it's hard to, it's, it's in a sense, it's, it's hard to um, determine. So the failure to pay certified amount is by and large the most common ground that is um, being used, okay? Because once you're certified, then um, the amount is there. And, you know, unless you have value set off, otherwise you have to pay. And if you don't pay, then there is a ground for you to, to invoke the determination provision, okay? And that is in addition to your right to suspend work because of non-payment. And of course, you know, you can still pursue your other claims. So again, um, the procedure is, is almost a mirror in the sense that you, you must have the grounds to issue the notice of default. And then if the default is not remedy, then you will have the right to, to, to issue the notice of determination. So in terms of um, contractor insolvency and employees insolvency, the difference is that for these type of um, events, then there's no need to have that, no, uh, that, that, that period between the notice of default and determination. So the determination can take place immediately without the need to go through um, the, the earlier procedure that I mentioned, meaning you have to give default and then allow that opportunity for the defaulting party to remedy the default before you determine. So that, that steps need not, uh, uh, it, it doesn't need to happen if this is due to insolvency. Now, so the important point that I tried to mention just now, whether it's contractor determining or employees determining is that um, it's important to comply with the contractual procedures, 
Otherwise, the termination may be invalid or unlawful, even though the substance were there. Even though the contractor may have fallen behind by, say, 50%, very clear, right? they failed to proceed regularly and diligently. But yet, because you, you did not follow the procedure, that may render the entire determination invalid. And we have plenty of cases that actually the courts have repeatedly hold that, look, because this is a contract, you have to follow the contract in order for you to properly invoke the right given to you under the contract. Okay, so um, I think Sajjah Manjian Singh is, is, is certainly a classic case, you know, where the mode of delivery was put in question, even though it is not in dispute that the notice was actually received, but because the mode of delivery is not one of those that was prescribed in the, uh, the, the determination clause, therefore the determination was held to be invalid. So that may sound like an extreme case, but I, I think the question here is that for the party who wants to determine, you know, the burden on you to comply with the procedure is there, and that burden is not difficult to discharge. It's not asking you to get some, you know, get the stars, get the moon, that kind of thing. So it's really just make sure that you open your eyes, read the provision carefully, identify the mode of delivery, be clear what you want to say in the notice, and just do it. Okay, so there's really no reason why these provisions um, 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 could not be complied with. So, um, but of course, sometimes, you know, situation may change and sometimes you can sense maybe there is also um, a, a shift in, in, in how judiciary may look at this. Um, but again, this may only represent a very seasonal thing that, you know, or maybe a, an odd case where um, they, they look at it and say that, hey, look, you know, if the guy received the letter, received the notice, why should we be uh, uh, too bothered about how it was transmitted? Because, you know, he received it, you know, so why, why should the, the party in default be allowed to escape liability because of one insignificant error made by the other party, which does, does not affect the substance of the case? Well, there are much way to this type of argument, but really, it's not a risk that a terminating party wants to take. I think that's the bottom line. You know, to comply with the procedure in the, therefore it is um, important. Um, now, in, under clause 25, um, there are post determinations obligations that need to be com need to be com uh, uh, complied with, and this is actually something that um, let me just go straight to the last point here uh, before I go backwards again. Is the issue of determination and termination? Why is that? In, why why is there such a distinction now? Traditionally, when we say you, when you terminate a contract, it means you put an end to the contract. When once you put an end of the contract, whether the termination is rightful or wrongful, the contract ends. It, it, it dies. Okay. What it means is that both parties, technically speaking, are discharged from further performance of the contract. So if there are residual performance that you're supposed to do under the contract, arguably you can say that, hey, look. The only reason why I need to do the residual obligation is because of the contract. Now, if this contract um, 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 is terminated, no longer applies, and I'm discharged from this contract, then I'm no longer bound. So I am not going to do those residual obligations because there's no longer a contract that binds me to it or, to, or for you to enforce it against me. So that is where a distinction is drawn between determination of employment and termination of contract, whereby the, the PAM is structured in such a way that I am only determining your employment in the contract. That means I employ you under the contract to do this work. And it is that part that I'm determining, I stop it. But the contract doesn't die automatically together with the time when I determine your employment under the contract. And therefore, there are residual obligations under the contract which you're supposed to do, which is, which are all these post-determination obligation that you need to um, 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 yield and give me the sign. You, you need to keep the, all the equipment there. If I want to use, I can use. If I want you to assign to me, you got to assign to me. Whatever contract that you have with third parties, I will compel you to assign it to me. Um, all the interest and right to use. Now, all these are obligations placed upon a contractor after his employment has been determined. So if this is a termination of contract scenario, the contractor can say, look, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to assign all this to you because I am no longer bound by a contract. So I no longer have any obligation 
to, to do what you ask me to, or whatever the contract says, I'm discharged. So therefore, PAM is having this determination of employment, whereby the contract remains alive in a way, in order for all these residual obligations to be enforceable. And if these are not done, that is considered as a further breach of the contract, which may then entitle the employer um, to further damages or, or, or further comp compensation arising from this new set of breach that Hong, is Hong Lek, I'll, the... I'll have to give you about one minute to conclude here. And uh, I think you're almost towards right. your end anyway. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, so that's why I feel that it's important for me to quickly jump over to 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 that um, the, the, the difference between determination and termination, so that you know we, we can understand why they insist on using determination of employment and whether or not there is a difference. So, in my view, there is a difference. Okay, subtle it may be, but there is a difference, and the, the use of the word determination is obviously um, um in that sense deliberate. So. Um, yes, I think that, that that's all I'm, I'm going to say. Um, the last point I will just quickly make is that, of course, in PAM contract, that is um, one of the uh, uh, most debated items is the fact that um, once the termination happened, it says that employer don't need to pay anymore. So cases have held that that amounting, amounted to conditional payment under the CPA Act and is therefore unenforceable. Um, this issue hasn't gone all the way up. I think it's still pretty much alive. So hopefully, you know, uh, soon we will have some clarity on that. And certainly PAM 2018 is trying to remedy that by narrowing the scope in the sense that only for those that have not been certified, I don't need to pay you. But whatever that's been certified and due, that should still be paid. So um, thank you I for that. that online, yeah. up my, my session. Thank you. Thank you, Satinda. Thank you. And that's a very interesting part as well. I'm sure we can even talk for a long time on that point. <laughs> and uh, we wait for a decision on that uh, very soon. Uh, well, Gathering from what you have said, uh, everyone should note that meticulous compliance with the procedural requirements for the terms of the contract is very important in order to determine the contract. Thank you for that, uh, Hong Leng. Now I'll just move on to our third speaker today. Uh, what's up? Right, moving down this path after termination uh, of the contract, naturally the most important next step is the resolution of the dispute that may have arisen between parties. PAM 2018 has uh, various mechanisms. Could you enlighten the viewers on the alternative dispute resolution methods uh, provided for under PAM 2018, uh, concentrating on the key requirements in commencing the same under the contract? Absolutely, uh, Satinda. Uh, dispute resolution clauses are often uh, neglected. Parties don't pay attention to it at the outset. Uh, I've, in fact, uh, cobbled together a few slides, which I hope uh, will be helpful. So let me share these with you. Are you able to see the slides, uh, Satinda? Yes, yeah, we got it. Nice. Excellent. Excellent. So essentially, when, uh, when you are surveying the types of dispute resolution uh, uh, methods, the disputology, as some may call it, um, we see that for uh, PAM 2018, uh, regardless of whether you look at the with quantities or without quantities uh, uh, versions of it, have honed in on four of these uh, types of, um, uh, of methods. Now, you may wonder, um, you know, what is the similarity or distinction between these uh, methods? And often we hear uh, various definitions being brandied about that talk about you know, a neutral individual or an independent third party. And that is actually the similarity between all these methods. It really, those definitions don't add any value because all four methods require the engagement of someone who is neutral, who is independent from the parties, who is not tainted by any conflict aspects to play a role in the resolution of the dispute. However, the uh, three circles uh, that we see to the right, expert determination, adjudication, and arbitration, which are governed in clauses 35 to 37 of PAM 2018, these are forms of what I would call determinative ADR, where you have a top-down decision imposed on the parties. So in that regard, mediation stands out. It is the odd one out, because mediation does not involve a decision made for the parties, Rather, it involves uh, the mediator playing the role of a facilitator, as we say, to assist the parties to come to an agreement. 
Now, when we uh, look at dispute resolution clauses in any commercial agreement, I would recommend that it's very instructive to take a step back and understand or appreciate the very framework of these uh, of, of the mechanisms applicable. Because commercial contracts generally fall in one of these three categories. These are really the possibilities that you could see. It could be a flat dispute resolution mechanism. Now that would entail you going straight to your dispute resolution forum, directly to it, be it court or arbitration, the contract prescribes that that is the mechanism for you to resolve your disputes. Or it could be what we call a tiered dispute resolution. Now, lawyers you know, will, will refer to these uh, tiered resolution methods they are using various terms. Um, they are also known as escalation clauses or stepped clauses. Sometimes you hear it referred to an ADR first framework or even the acronym MTDR to stand for multi-tiered uh, dispute resolution. What it has in common is that we have a series of steps or phases. Now, an a, a example that springs to mind of a two-step dispute uh, resolution framework can be found in our uh, JKR form 203A, where reference to the superintending officer is a condition precedent to arbitration. And an example of multi-tiered, for example, that you can see in uh, the CIDB standard form of contract for Building Works 2000, that actually provides a three-step process uh, between the superintending officer to mediation and then to arbitration. So your first um, uh, uh, question or your first look at a contract should uh, envisage studying and understanding what is the framework applicable. Now, when it comes to tiered uh, dispute resolution clauses, I think a question naturally arising is what approach our Malaysian courts take in, in this regard. And the position is somewhat divergent to some of the other common law jurisdictions. I cannot uh, pass this area without mentioning the federal court decision in Juara Serata, uh, Juara Serata against Alpha Rich. It is, of course, interesting because it emanates from our apex court. It's also interesting because I understand our Mr. Our learned Mr. Moderator was representing one of the parties in this case. So feel free to, you know, uh, to <laughs> quite rigorously in the Q&A about this uh, case because he had knowledge as counsel for Alpha Ridge. But essentially, this case concerned a construction project uh, in Sarawak for uh, national service unity uh, camps. There was a dispute on the uh, interim payment certificate. The contract was not a PAM uh, form of contract, rather it was a bespoke contract which provided for two tiers. Um, first tier was reference to the architect or consultant and arbitration uh, had to be triggered within a stipulated time frame from that, uh, that uh, reference, failing which it, the um, certification was deemed final and binding. So the case is valuable because our federal court stress that parties should effectively adhere to these multi-tier clauses. In other words, if you have such a clause and it's worded in such a way, it is a condition precedent. You are not allowed to resile from the terms inserted in the agreement. Uh, otherwise, you know, you, you would be uh, taking advantage of your wrong. Now, so quickly moving through the uh, various dispute resolution methods. The first one, as I mentioned, is uh, clause 34, mediation. This is not a new clause in PAM 2018. It was uh, also in uh, PAM 2006 in clause uh, uh, 35 there. So it's substantially uh, similar. The key points to note is you must have a written agreement to mediate. And the appointing authority would be the president of Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia. So parties can mutually agree within a set time frame. If they fail to agree, then you go to the um, uh, president of PAM. And of course, mediation can be invoked during the currency of the contract. Now, the question you would want to ask yourself is whether this is a step clause. Is this a multi-tier clause? In other words, must you exhaust this remedy first before you go to arbitration or, or adjudication? In other words, is mediation a condition precedent to alternate modes of dispute resolution provided in the contract? 
The answer is found in 34.1. 34.1 of the clause actually gives you the clue by using the word may. Our courts have historically uh, the traditional position. In fact, the position is if you use permissive language such as may, then it gives you an option. It's not obligatory. But PAM goes one step further so that there's no doubt whatsoever. It expressly says that mediation is not a condition precedent to adjudication or arbitration. Okay, so no doubt you do not have to go for mediation, but it's there for you if you want to invoke it. Now, moving quickly to expert determination. So the uh, provisions for expert determination in clause 35 uh, of PAM 2018 broadly resembles the provisions for mediation. The mechanism or the procedural steps are almost the same. You need a written agreement. Once again, if parties fail to mutually agree on the um, uh, expert, then you would appeal or rather you'd apply to the president of PAM and this procedure can be uh, invoked during the currency of the contract. Expert determination hasn't really gained traction in Malaysia yet. Uh, I, I would want to contrast this method to expert evaluation. That is where the expert just comes up with a non-binding advisory uh, recommendation or valuation or, or view on the, the facts. Um, so this is more suited to highly technical disputes. One of the reasons why it hasn't gained traction yet is that it's very, very new. It's appeared for the first time in 2018. There was no equivalent in PAM 2006, but I understand PAM is pushing expert determination as a, a, a valuable uh, a possible uh, avenue to look at. Again, I will ask the same question. Is it a stepped um, re dispute resolution method? Is, it, is expert determination a condition precedent? Once again, we see the permissive term may being used in clause 35.1. And again, PAM makes it um, very clear, it's crystal clear that expert determination is, is not a condition precedent. Okay, so neither of these modes are tiered or uh, set out as stepped dispute resolution methods. All right. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. I'm very conscious of the compressed time frame, and that's why I'm, I'm, uh, I am speaking rather rapidly. This is not uh, how I would, uh, but anyway, let's move on to the third um, mode, which is, of course, adjudication. Now, for adjudication, this can be invoked by one party giving written notice to the other. The mechanism is, of course, prescribed. And the appointing authority, if the parties are unable to uh, agree or no consensus on the adjudicator, would be the president of PAM. Now, I want to point out, or a little bit of a critique, that the time frame for the president of PAM to revert to the parties has not been prescribed in Clause 36. Okay? Just as in for mediation or expert determination, but those um, modes are generally less, uh, less popular anyway. But here the time frame has not been uh, prescribed. And I would want to contrast this to SIPA, okay? uh, our statutory adjudication, where the director of AIAC is given a very short five working days from the request for, uh, for adjudication, a request for uh, appointment of the adjudicator to respond to the parties. Here it's left open. So um, I would then move to the question again of whether contractual adjudication is a condition precedent to the alternative, mo alternate modes of uh, dispute resolution. And the answer, interestingly, is yes you do have to uh, make a prior reference or in order to preserve your right of arbitration. Okay, that's what clause 36.1 says. And that, that ensuing right of reference to arbitration can only take place after the date of practical completion. Now, before you uh, get too troubled about that clause, let me point out that adjudication, contractual adjudication, we're not talking about statutory adjudication under SIPA, of course, but contractual adjudication under PAM has a very narrow scope. It is limited to the employer set off under clause 34, 30.4, all right? So the employer is obliged to first use this step. So you have a true two-step 
mechanism here. It is a tier dispute resolution. If the employer wants to uh, raise a set off, it, it, the employer is required to invoke this adjudication clause. Again, a bit of a critique. This is a very one-sided clause. It's somewhat surprising that PAM has not uh, seen fit to make this cut both ways to the employer and the contractor. One could ask why is it this only applies to the employer's entitlements and not to the uh, contractor's uh, entitlements as well. Now, the, a few key features about the adjudication decision. Now, if the, um, once the employer make, uh, sorry, once the adjudicator makes a decision here uh, under this contractual ad adjudication clause, parties are, parties are bound with, to this decision until practical completion and written notice needs to be given to make a reference to uh, arbitration within six weeks. I must make it very clear, uh, as you can see from this slide, that we are talking about contractual adjudication and not SIPA. SIPA also applies, even though PAM uh, is silent or doesn't make a reference to SIPA, SIPA uh, being a statutory pro uh, provision uh, uh, would apply. So see that as an overlaying uh, provision. We also have that temporary dispute resolution method, uh, you know, uh, that quick fix, rough justice in, in the form of SIPA is also applicable, although not mentioned in the PAM contract. What's I have to give you a one minute warning. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right. That's, have, that's, that's fine. Yeah. I will, I will move uh, quite quickly. Uh, to say final clause is, of course, arbitration. So that ties up quite nicely. And I would want to mention that arbitration under PAM is mandatory. It uses the word shall. Our federal court interpreting the 2006 edition of PAM in the Tindak Mooney case basically confirmed that arbitration is exclusive and um, you, you can't uh, just bypass and go to court in view of this uh, arbitration clause. All right. Now, finally, I do want to, uh, I think there's time to just mention uh, one more interesting case. And that is the case that tells us what to do if the PAM president fails to appoint the arbitrator. This is the case of Ragawang Corporation against uh, one Emirin. It's a high court decision from the Shah Alam uh, High Court, the decision of uh, the construction court there, Mr. Justice Wong Kian Kiong, essentially tells us that we can read Section 13 of the Arbitration Act together with the PAM contract. So if the PAM president fails to appoint, we should then go to the director of the AIAC. Only if the director of the AIAC uh, does not uh, 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 revert, do we then ask the court to appoint the arbitrator. Okay, so that's indeed a very instructive uh, uh, point. All right, and um, let me just wrap up uh, to say that for arbitration, you generally cannot commence until after practical completion or determination or abandonment of the works. And that's it from me. Thank you, Wetzala. Thank you so much for that uh, very descriptive and uh, interesting um, explanation about the, all the clauses available, all the options available for dispute resolution under the PAM contract. Okay, uh, we've come to this stage uh, where we have a few questions to be answered uh, by the STEAM panel here. Um, now, I'll just throw it out. And uh, although some of the questions have been uh, focused to the speakers, some have not. So if anyone's willing to answer, uh, just let me know. The first question is, uh, if notice under PAM for EOT is a condition precedent and the work is delayed, solely due to a significant delay of the architect's drawing and the contractor does not submit a notice. Can the architect reject this claim for EOT outright on the grounds that the contractor failed to give notice, even though the reason was clearly and solely an act of prevention by the architect? Taya, I guess this one goes down your alley. Yeah, uh, good, good morning. Good morning, Nassim. Th thanks for the interesting question. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, historically, as, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the, the position was, you know, building contracts had these notice provisions, but they didn't expressly state that they were conditions precedent. Uh, so, you know, I think it has been decided by various authorities at that time before contracts provided that these notices were conditions precedent, that uh, so long as the employer or the uh, architect knew of the delay, 
uh, there was no necessity for notice, just as a matter of, of common sense, because you already know of the delay. So what is the logic of me notifying you of something, the contractor notifying you of something which you already know of? And I think then, you know, the, the current form of FIDIC and PAM and all that, you know, which have come out in 2017 and 2018 are intended to then deal with, with that situation and say, you know, if you want an extension of time, put in a notice, it's a condition precedent. So it's, it's, it's an attempt to get around those earlier authorities, you know, which said that if the employer is aware, there is no need for notice. Uh, I, I understand the thinking behind these new provisions in PAM and FIDIC is this, uh, that yes, you know, there can be an event of delay. The employer is aware of the event of delay, but the question is whether that event has, sorry, there has been an event, the employer is aware of that event. The question then is whether that event has indeed caused delay to the contractor. And, and that is what notice needs to be given off. Because you know, as, as you are aware, various events can happen, but not necessarily those events don't necessarily cause delay. So that is what the notice uh, from the contractor is for. But uh, certainly, I, I think it would remain perhaps a moot point where it's it's so obvious, you know, like the examples you cite, where you know it's a question of drawing simply not being handed over to the contractor or drawings being revised substantially and significantly, uh, whether in those instances, uh, notice will still be required. Uh, certainly at, at present, uh, the Court of Appeal seems to be leaning in favor of enforcing these notice provisions in contracts. Uh, the only way which appear, that appears to be to get around it is you know, by arguing some sort of waiver position that the employer by their conduct or the contract administrator by their conduct has, has waived that notice requirement. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Taya. Uh, another question from the floor is, um, is proper and accurate reporting of for progress updates considered part of the contractor's obligation for regularly and for regular and diligently? Uh, not quite sure what is, who is it addressed to, but uh, anyone would like to answer that? I think most likely is my my part, you know, because yeah. I did mm -hmm. mention that regularly and diligently are something mm -hmm. that's quite subjective. Well, I mean, looking at the questions, I think um, what the clause twenty five require is to proceed with the works, not so mm -hmm. much how you prepare the report. So um, preparation of report is subject to different types of requirements depending on what the contract says, you know. So. Um, it's a different set of obligations. Uh, what, what it meant is that. So if, if the question posed is, is proper and not accurate reporting of progress update considered as part of contractor's obligation for regularity and diligently, um, I would say no, because that regularity and diligently were being used um, in the context of actually doing the work. Um, um, and, and I don't believe that you know, uh, submitting reports uh, can be considered as um, part of actually doing the, the, the works. You know, the works identified in the contract mean, meant the actual construction work. So, um, yeah, so, so I, I think that that is uh, my view there. Okay, thank you. Um, I think just to give Vatsala a chance on a question as well, <laughs> I'll, uh, go to this one. Can the panelists share their thoughts on mandating mediation in construction contracts? That's an extremely uh, great uh, question. Um, Proponents who say that um, mediation should be uh, mandated effectively are saying that arbitration and court are too um, uh, adversarial uh, and do, don't do anything to preserve relationships. So forcing a mediation upon the parties will force effectively enforce a cooling off uh, period and make court or arbitration the last resort. But I would ask, uh, ask parties to reflect on whether this is true in all, all cases. Because I have seen that such tiered clauses, especially when uh, you make mediation or, or some other uh, method, a condition precedent, could have the converse effect and it can be unanticipated sometimes. So parties can actually um, take advantage tactically of this, uh, of the fact that you've got to go through um, some condition precedent by uh, waiting time and cost. So you're really adding a layer of unnecessary bureaucracy, which may not be fitting in all cases. 
Some cases are time sensitive and some cases by their very nature are destined and designed to go straight for arbitration uh, and, and or to court. So I would think that mediation should certainly be available as an option in the uh, contracts, but it should not be made mandatory. That's my view. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take one more question because uh, we're already getting close to the time and I want a bit of a recap later on. So uh, uh, Hong Lang, I think this one will be for you. Uh, would They would like to know, uh, someone from the floor would like to know, how do we determine which clauses survive after determination or termination? Well, um, I think a quite specific under clause 25, there are post-determination um, obligations, which are very clear that it says that upon determination of employment, these things do happen, you know. Um, and of course, in addition to that, there are contractual provisions which are by nature, is meant to survive the termination of the contract. You know, of course, if you have things like confidentiality, you know, um, IP and some of these things, uh, even arbitration for that matter, um, it's always meant to survive termination. So, so that one is by nature, it's always meant to survive termination. I think that's by operation of law. Um, but I think specifically under clause 25, it also does say that that's why it's all parked under the same clause in clause 25 and 26, meaning once determination happened and these things happen. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, guys, um, before we conclude today, I just would like each of the speakers uh, to give a closing remark. Just a short one on the possible areas of concerns or improvements in relation to the PAM contract or any other thoughts you wish to wish to share today. Uh, Taya, maybe we start with you. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, uh, two things uh, from, from, from my earlier talk. Uh, one, in so far as the extension of time uh, provisions are concerned, you know, given the, the, the Court of Appeals reason leaning towards enforcing these notice provisions, it's important to be aware of them and to give the relevant notices. Uh, you know, I, I think all the big contractors, what they do now is they have a standard form notice, which they just tick off and send in. And that is something which uh, parties should consider doing, at, at least, you know, in major in infrastructure projects. Uh, in so far as liquidated damages are concerned, uh, the changes that have been brought about by Cubic are interesting. Uh, it's interesting also to see how the standard form contracts will be uh, now amended to, to cater for Cubic because uh, PAM was pre-Cubic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Honling, anything to add? Uh, sorry, Honling, your, your mic. Yeah. Nope. Well, I think in terms of determination and termination, really, I think um, one, one particular aspect that we, we should be looking at is that um, although it does say that your, your right to terminate under the common law is not affected, but how the determination of employment under a PEM contract and the termination of contract under common law, even though they're not supposed to affect each other, but whether or not they can ex be exercised concurrently, and if so, how, um, that could well be an interesting area to, to look into. You know? So um, do you like, I determine employment now, but at the same time, that is also considered termination of contract in an alternative, do we accept that proposition? So I think that is probably something that, you know, um, a little bit of ambiguities have, have, have also appeared. Thank you, Hong Leng. What's up? Well, uh, looking at it, uh, looking at the dispute resolution aspect of uh, PAM, my first specific uh, proposed reform would be to introduce the, a precise time frame for the president of PAM to respond to the parties on appointment. I think that's a, a, a definite improvement that could be made. And secondly, I would just strike through the contractual adjudication clause. I would delete it entirely. It is patently unfair. And of course, uh, both sides do have uh, the option of uh, uh, invoking STIPA if necessary. That's, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Taya, Hongleng, Watsala, once again uh, for this very interesting and riveting presentation today. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone who attended this event. And uh, now I'll hand over to our MC, uh, Chi Wang, to conclude. Thank you, Sadiq.